Church family. I'm Charlene. I'm Elaine. I'm Catherine. Please stand if you're able for the reading of God's Word. Today's reading is from the book of John 1 verses 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him, and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we all have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Good morning and welcome wherever you're tuning in from or you're here in person or in the commons. Um, Maybe you're at one of the um, remand institutions or centers around the province. We're very glad that you're here with us. My name is Josh. A special welcome to those tuning in from the Okanagan. Some of you have been reaching out and you've heard the news that we're planting a new congregation in Kelowna. Um, We're very excited about that as a church. I'm very excited about that because I grew up in the interior. I'm looking forward to coming back and I really believe that God's got a big work still yet planned for the Okanagan. Could not be more excited about that. My wife and I and family very much looking forward to that and meeting some of you. If you're feeling perhaps um, that same burden just a burden for that place you've been carrying for a while. I know many of you have come from there and you, you've been praying and pondering and maybe sensing the Lord leading you in that direction. We would love to chat with you. Uh, others though, we're hoping a team will join us as we go, but we're also um, really, really just desiring that many, many, many that we call Westside Home would join together in praying in this direction. We need prayer supporters and of course we need some and trust that the Spirit's going to burden some to join and financially support this new endeavor too. But all this information is up on the website wchurch.ca. You can find some more info there. This morning we're going to be continuing on in the Gospel of John. Love this book. This is a series we've been titling titling Zeal. And as you just heard, we've been in this first 18 verses for a few weeks. And we're going to be there um, for another week as well. Because it is theologically dense text. It is, uh, it's some really, I just, I love this. We could park here for much longer than four weeks. But uh, really what I see John doing here uh, is digging a well. A really deep well that he's going to draw from for the remainder of this book. He's going to keep reaching down into these 18 verses and and, and drawing from it throughout the rest of his gospel. Um, Go and read it. Read it through a few times. I'd encourage you, go and read the gospel of John too. Read John's other writings. It is, it's so good. But these these first 18 verses really are setting the stage uh, for where we're going to be going throughout the whole series. Um, the five verses this morning we're in are going to be verses 9 to 13, and uh, they're no exception, really, really theologically dense text. Uh, if you've ever been to Costco and bought a section of meat, had the privilege of getting to do that, you know when you take it out of the wrapper, you don't get to just chop it straight up into, into steaks. There's some work that needs to be done to divide it, um, and, and depending on the cut you buy, sometimes there's up to three different pieces that you need to separate and then deal with individually. That's sort of what I'm going to do this morning. I'm going to break the text, these five verses up, into three chunks. So they're up on the screen. The three
three things we're gonna look at is the revelation of the light, the rejection of the light, and the reception of the light, or the light revealed, the light rejected, the light received. So you've already heard the text read, but if you haven't already, go ahead, grab your Bibles, open them up to 1 John. We're gonna begin in verse nine, and while you do that, um, do please have a Bible on hand to follow along with. Uh, while you're grabbing that, I wanna open us up in a word of prayer. Oh, Jesus, I just, I thank you. Thank you for, for the word. Thank you for the time in worship already this morning, the reminder of all that you've accomplished on our behalf, for us, for our benefit. And then we, as we open the word, just reminded of the gift that this is, that you're a self-revealing God who has preserved your words that you spoke through your servants as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit for our benefit today. 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, scriptures breathed out by you. These are your words. They're given to us to instruct us, to rebuke us, to correct us, and to train us in righteousness so that we could be equipped lacking nothing, equipped for every good work. And so as we open the word, would you do that? Rebuke, correct, train, instruct us, your servants. Holy Spirit, the work that you've called me to, I can't do apart from you. And so I pray for your empowerment. I pray that as the, just as you've ministered to me richly in my hours and hours spent just deep diving, studying the depth of this word, that some of it would come alive in other hearts as well. Use me. I'm just a frail vessel, but Holy Spirit, would you come breathe your fire onto the kindling that I've stacked, ignite the words of Christ, change us as a result of it. We pray this. In the name of the Son, to the Father, amen. All right, so if you have your Bibles, we are going to read verse 9. Just so you know where we are, I'm going to read it in entirety, and then we'll kind of go back and chip it apart. Uh, Verse 9 says, The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, the world was made through him, yet the world didn't know him. He came to his own, and his own people didn't receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Opens up by saying, the true light, the true light. And the first question we need to ask ourselves as good students of the Bible is, what does John mean when he is saying true light? So we read the Bible, we need to ask questions. Some of you have been told you shouldn't ask questions. You should ask questions. And a really good one to start with is, what on earth is John communicating when he says true light? What is he revealing about Jesus when he says true light? Well, in order to unpack this, we need to consider the context into which John is speaking this. Um, most, most commentators agree John is writing this gospel from Ephesus. He's living in Ephesus. Um, he's probably writing to the people in Ephesus. Um, and so because he lived there, it's in good likelihood he's writing to the people there. It was, um, Ephesus was a, a place composed much like a church anywhere else. So there's an emerging church in Ephesus, it's just like anywhere else. There is two groups of people in it. There is Jews who had been dispersed from their land uh, due to persecution and found themselves living all over the world. There's Jews and there's the, the national people who live there. In this case, there's a Greco people living there. Um, so we have in Ephesus probably a group of Jews for Jesus and Greeks. And to the Jews who are living here where this letter is being received, when John says the true light, it would communicate something to them very important about Jesus. By using this word combination of true light, John is seeking to communicate something very important about Jesus. When the Jews there heard this combination of true light, it probably would have brought to mind a couple scriptures from the Old Testament. A couple of famous prophecies, I think, from Isaiah would have come to mind immediately. Up on the screen, we have Isaiah 6.2. Isaiah 6.2, very, very well-known prophecy. Um, pardon me, Isaiah 9.2. Um, Isaiah 9 is a very famous chapter speaking of the coming Messiah. 
but we read in verse two there, um, it says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. Describing Jesus as the true light, the Jewish people, they would have seen John grabbing themes from the Old Testament and pulling them together here. And, and I believe they would have understood John to be presenting Jesus as the promised Messiah of the Old Testament, the hope of the Old Testament. But this theme of light, it continues on throughout Isaiah 9. I love going to Isaiah 9 uh, when I share the gospel with Jehovah's Witnesses. I encounter them on the streets, I always go here. Um, and a little later, it's because it, this is a presentation of Jesus. All the gospel writers dip back into Isaiah 9 because this was the, kind of the best known section of prophecy about the coming Messiah. But I love going to Isaiah 9 and then going to, to, to verse six. If you read there with me, it says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And I love pausing there and just asking them, who is this talking about? Who do you think this is talking about? And the answer, of course, is Jesus, because Matthew 1 cites this. We, we, this comes up at Christmas every year in all of our songs. But listen to this. This is talking about Jesus, but look at what else it says about this coming light. Read on in verse six with me. It says, the government shall be upon his shoulders and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In dipping back and, and calling Jesus the light, identifying him with this light source in Isaiah 9, he's not only pointing him out to be the Messiah of the Old Testament, he's showing him to be the true God of the universe. I think another verse um, from Isaiah probably would have come to mind too, Isaiah 60, another famous chapter. But in Isaiah 60, verse two, we read about the light again. It says, arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. For behold, darkness covers the earth, a thick darkness is over the people, but the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will appear over you. So he's using Isaiah as these images of light, the light rising. John's grabbing hold of that and saying, Jesus is that light that is risen. But notice what Isaiah says about the light that is rising. He says, it's the Lord that rises on you. In your Bibles, this is all caps. The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, because this is, um, if you're a little theologically nerdy like me, this is the tetragrammaton, this is the name of God from the Old Testament, Yadve Udve Yahweh. John is showing God, um, Jesus to be God, and he's using, he's tying Jesus back to the very name of God. To the Jewish listeners, he's using inside language to reveal Jesus. But almost poetically, quite amazingly, John's also, he's gonna use some Greek inside language to reveal who Jesus is. When he describes Jesus as the true light, he's also dipping into the Greek culture and, and revealing Jesus to be who he truly is as well. Really, not just Greek culture, but all culture. Uh, the religions um, outside of Judaism, really all of them were steeped in light and dark dualism. This idea that there's these two opposing forces of light and dark battling it out. Um, this was present in Gnosticism, Docetism, Greek mythology, pagan folklore, all of it had these, this imagery of light and dark dualism. In fact, if you take a look around today, this is still present. Religions today still have this, this yin and yang, light and dark. We have it in our language. We say thing like, things like, well, that's some really dark stuff. That guy's really good. We, we, ha we, we acknowledge these opposing forces. And I think John is presenting Jesus as the true light because he wants him to see that these religions, 
this concept of light and dark. Everything that they'd been grasping to explain, their light and dark dualism. Jesus is the light. He didn't go on, and I find this really remarkable because he didn't actually offer them a crash course in Jewish history. He doesn't say, well, here, let me take you through the whole Old Testament and then present Jesus to you. He goes right into their beliefs and says, hey, that thing that you have been wrestling to explain, that's Jesus. You see Paul do this in Acts 17 at Mars Hill as well with the, the statue to the unknown God. He just incarnates the gospel, enculturates the gospel right where the people that he's presenting it to are at. That's, that's another topic. We could go down that road, but Jesus, John is saying, is the true light. And John, he actually uses this word um, true nine other times in this gospel. It's going to come up many different times. Um, quite probably noteworthy. None of the other gospel writers do. John uses this word again in his other letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Revelation. He uses this word 12 other times, and we only see it show up four times in the rest of the whole New Testament. So there's something very unique here. This is John's, one of his favorite words. There's a big thing he's trying to do. So to help us understand this word, I want to go to a couple different instances where John uses it. These won't be up on your screen, but um, you can follow along. John 4.23, if you want to turn there. If not, I'll, I'll read it. It says there, true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and truth. True worshipers. Now, all are worshipers. Every single one of us, we're worshiping something, living our lives for something. But John is saying there's a true way to do this. Really, all of us, the, the issue, really what sin is, is a faulty worship. The worship of lesser things. John in using true is pointing out, hey, everyone worships, some are doing it correctly. John 17, three, a little further on, um, this verse is gonna come up all kinds of times throughout the series, but um, he says there, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. There's all sorts of other small g gods, things that people call God, but there's only one true God. The Greek word for true here, uh, just to get a little nerdy with you, is aletheinos. Aletheinos in Greek, it's, it's a neat word. It means true as opposed to spurious. True as opposed to imperfect. The, the definition, I think, that suits it best is that which has not only the name and resemblance, but the real nature corresponding to that name. There is other things people worship, but only one thing that's really worthy of worship. There are other small g gods, but there's only one true God, one who deserves that name, who fully resembles it and has the nature corresponding to such a grand title. In describing Jesus as the true light, John is revealing Jesus to be the hope of the Old Testament and the true God of the whole universe. And the third thing that I think he's trying to do is he's trying to, to reveal that Jesus is that which by all other things can be known. Jesus is the true light by which anything that can be known is known. He's saying to his Greek, his Jewish audience, as well as to us, whatever you are, that Jesus is the one true light, the light that everything else points to like the moon, reflects the light of the sun. And you can find your way at sea, at night, by it, but has no light in and of itself. It only reflects the light. Jesus is the one true light that everything else reflects imperfectly. And that's why I think he says that he gives light to everyone. Because whether we acknowledge it or not, we're all walking in the light of it. Even if for some reason you sleep all day, maybe you're a teenage boy, and you wake up at night 
and, and you've never seen the sun, it does not mean it's not there. It's still there. You're only alive because of it. Similarly, everything that is true is true because of him. He's the true light. He's the true light that all other demi-lights try to reflect. He wants everyone to know this, the Jews, the Greeks, us 2,000 years later, Jesus is the true light. There are those who deny the moon landing ever happened. There are. There are those who believe that John McCartney, the present John McCartney, is not the real original John McCartney, but he was at one point killed in a car accident and replaced by a fellow named Billy Shears as a lookalike so the Beatles could continue to put out amazing albums. There are those who deny COVID is real. There are those who deny that the earth is round. And um, I read a really interesting story about a fellow who built a steam-powered rocket ship to launch himself up into the Earth's atmosphere in order to photograph and prove to us heliocentric Earthers that the Earth is indeed flat. I'll let you go and read that story and guess how that ended. Uh, There are people who deny birds are real and claim that the CIA has wiped them all out and replaced them with drone technology to observe us all. And there are people who deny that there is a God. And there is tinfoil hat level crazy. And then there is just buck nutty crazy. Off your rockers crazy. Because every single human being on the face of the earth is living in the light of the true light. Every single one. They're enjoying the light that has been reflected by the true light. They just might not be acknowledging it. They're enjoying the benefit of things that can only be provided if there is a God. For example, purpose. We're obsessed with this notion of purpose. We, we, finding our calling, finding Mr. Right, finding Mr. Right, finding that, that perfect job. We love the idea of fulfilling our destiny. The problem is um, you can only have that if there's a God. If you actually have a purpose, you need a God who's given you a purpose. If you're a random matter and time and chance, if you're just a bag of biological goo, you don't have a purpose. You don't even really have personhood. You're a purposeless being in a purposeless world living out a purposeless existence. There's no God. You have no more purpose than a dust bunny. Well, science has disproved God. No, it hasn't. In fact, science relies upon presuppositions and foundations that can only be provided if there is a God. Consistency in nature. I mean, there's, well, you've hurt my feelings. Tough beans. If there's no God, if there's no moral lawgiver, you have no right to appeal to the foundation of moral rightness or wrongness. These are things you only have if there is a God. We are all living in the light that's provided by Jesus, whether we acknowledge it or not. I cracked open a really big, couple of really big eggs there. Um, I would love to actually just preach on that for an hour. Um, I'll direct you to a couple books though, Finding Truth by Nancy Piercy, if you want to investigate into some of those claims that I just kind of packed in a couple sentences, Ultimate Proof of Creation by Dr. Jason Lyle, a couple really good books that will address that, but what they point back to, what really all the evidence points back to is that there is a true light that we're all living in the light of it. We're basking in the light of it. John's inviting us to trace it back to its source and give praise to the one who it emanates from, Jesus. Just because you woke up at the crack of 8 p.m. oblivious to the fact that the sun's been shining all day long doesn't mean it's not there. You can't exist without him. Jesus is the true light. So I want to take a second and just ask us all, everyone listening, Are we living in the light of that? 
Are, are we, pardon me, are we actively enjoying the benefits of the light while failing to acknowledge it? John says early on in, uh, or pardon me, not early on, later on in the gospel, chapter 20, his purpose for writing this whole thing is so that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, we would have life in his name. Rightly beholding him frees us from the pursuit of these lesser demi-lights and invites us back into relationship with the true light. And it's in the worship and enjoyment of that light that we find true life. Many of us, we've been wayfaring across the sea, navigating by the, the light from lesser things, navigating by the light of the moon for sake of analogy. And the invitation of John in his presentation of Jesus as the true light is to trace that light back to its source and navigate your life around the light that he offers. In John 12, 46, Jesus says, I've come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Jesus came as the light of the world to invite you into, to come out of the dark. John's revelation of the light, it's an invitation to come to the light. The first chunk of this text, it's, um, it's all about the revelation of the light. And as we continue on now, uh, what we're gonna see is John's description of the rejection of this light. Verse nine, he said, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, the world was made through him, that the world didn't know him. It didn't know him. The light of the world was in the world and they didn't recognize him. The one who made the world was in the world and the ones that he made missed him. The one who Hebrews 1.3 says upholds the universe by the word of his power was there and people were oblivious to it. I was taking a flight uh, somewhere last year and on one of the seat back TVs, uh, there was this show, Undercover Boss. If you've ever had a chance to see it, the premise of it is um, some of the C-suite, CEOs, executives join the ranks of the working class in their company in order to understand how the company works, see how people are doing, and to reward uh, employees that do really well, at least on the Canadian version. Canadian version is all about hugging, reaffirming, sending people back to their home countries to reunite. But in the American version, they fire people from time to time and it gets really good. Um, they find people doing things that they shouldn't have been doing and they fire them. When I read John saying, the one who made the world was in the world and yet was not recognized by the world, it reminds me of the show Undercover Boss. The God who created the universe entered into it. Philippians 2, it says that he put on flesh. He added humanity to his divinity, came in the form of a servant, and entered into his creation. Verse 11 says, he came to his own and to his own people, and they didn't receive him. Now, this word, his own, his own people, it's the same Greek word, idios, and it means his own things. He came to his own things and they didn't receive him. This is undercover boss at a whole new level. He came to the things he made. He came to the people he formed. He came to the world that he spoke. Yet when he came into it, he wasn't just missed, he was rejected. If an undercover boss joined the rank of his staff and found his employees slandering him, sleeping on the job, stealing from the company, acting maliciously, selling company secrets. And then if one of these employees went on to actually sabotage the undercover boss, have him found guilty of a false crime, all in order to benefit themselves, what do you think the boss would do? He'd kick their derriere out the door. That's what he'd do. 
But as we continue reading the gospel of John, what we're going to see is that we not only rejected the light, we tried to snuff it out. And there's consequences for actions like this, just like there would be a consequence if you punched your boss in the face. There's a consequence for the rejection of the living God. John 3, 19 to 20, we read, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. People love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and doesn't come to it. Oh man, there's so much there in that text. I'm going to leave a, most of that for when we actually get to John 3. But notice when he, what he says the judgment is. The judgment is that we don't get the light. He just doesn't, we don't get the thing that we need. The thing we crave, the thing by which we live, the thing we were made for, the light that satisfies, we don't get it. Because we don't want it. John 5.40, Jesus himself says, you refuse to come to me to have life. There's a type of life, we've been saying this, that Jesus came to give, but we refuse it. I said in the prologue, this is dense. A really, really dense theology. And what John's doing is he's unpacking a big theme that will come up a lot as we work through the gospel. Um, but what we're seeing right here, him present is this rich theological theme, the fact that our wills are more damaged than we probably would care to realize. Our ability to come to God is actually non-existent because our desire is non-existent. We refuse, Jesus said it, we refuse to come to him. Paul says it this way, just to, to come out of John's writing into Paul, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he says the God, so the lowercase g, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. We, we won't come to the light on our own because we're blind. We're incapable of coming to the light in the same way that a blind man is incapable of skeet shooting. We don't come to the light because our capacities have been inhibited by the God of this world. But it's not just something that's been done to us, we're actually complicit. Ephesians 4.18 says, we're darkened in our understanding alienated from the life of God, that Zoe life, because of the ignorance that's in us. Due to what? The hardness of our hearts. To paraphrase Romans 1, it says, we didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him. Thus, we became futile in our thinking and our hearts were darkened. In presenting the rejection of the light, John ends up showing us the desperation of our state, our neediness. John, he's presenting the bad news of our reality in his prologue. And this is, again, a theme that's going to come up over and over and over and over in the Gospel of John. Let me give you a couple examples. Chapter 3, Nicodemus. Our kids are working through that this morning in Kids Church. Um, chapter 3, John tells how Nicodemus needs to, uh, tells him how to obtain eternal life. He says, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus, rightfully baffled, says... How can I be born again? Am I to enter into my mother a second time? The answer is, you can't do this on your own. What Jesus is pointing out in John 3, what John's pointing out is that we contribute no more to our second birth than we do our first. Chapter 5, John tells us about a paralyzed man laying by a pool of water. And from time to time, an angel would come down and would stir this pool of water and the first one in would get healed. But the paralyzed man had laid there for much of his life, unable to get himself in when the water was stirred. What John's pointing out is our inability to do what we need to do. We can't get what we need because we're like the paralyzed man. Chapter 10, John's 
presents Jesus as the good shepherd and we are um, by default the sheep, the stupid, dumb, defenseless creatures that if you're lost in the wilderness, die. The sheep as we read around Christmas in Psalm 23 that are nature's snack. They are defenseless creatures. We need a shepherd. The raising of Lazarus in John 11, it's a picture of how we are dead. And the only way that we're coming out of our tombs is if Jesus calls us. Lazarus played no part in coming out of that tomb other than doing exactly what the God of the universe told him to do, and that's our hope as well. John's betrayal of the betrayal, or pardon me, um, portrayal of the betrayal and crucifixion of Jesus. It's a portrait of how we, in our dead state, in our falseness, in our sin-stained depravity, reject God. We are like Judas who sells Jesus for pocket change. We are like the disciples who betray our friend. We are like the Roman guards who nail him to a couple pieces of wood. John's presenting the bad news of our reality. And this is a theme. It's gonna come up over and over and over. And if we don't recognize the bad news of our present condition, what he's about to present will never appear as good news to us. If we don't acknowledge our deadness, we will never experience the Zoe life that he came to give. If we don't acknowledge our blindness, we'll never have our eyes opened to the true light. If we don't acknowledge the darkness of our reality, we'll never come to the true light. And so I wanna ask a question. Do we believe this? Do you believe that you reject Jesus? Apart from God's grace, do you believe that you reject Jesus? Apart from Jesus regenerating your will, drawing you to himself, do you believe you would reject Jesus? Then I wanna ask, do our actions reflect that? Does the way we interact with those who believe differently or even reject or despise Jesus reflect the truth that apart from God's grace, we would as well? Do we have compassion on those who hate Christ? We need to see that we rejected the light. Apart from God opening our eyes, enabling us to see our darkness, we would do the same thing. Perhaps you're listening this morning and while literally basking in the light, you've been rejecting him. In another of his writings, the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible, John depicts quite clearly the fate that awaits those outside of Christ, that awaits those who reject Jesus. Those who rejected the light, it says Jesus is gonna come again to judge He's going to judge both the living and the dead. And if this were the end of the story, this would just be terrible, terrible news. This would be very depressing. You should be throwing things at me at this point. But this isn't where the gospel leads off. This isn't where John leaves off. He goes on to preach something so good. So good. He speaks a word into this darkness that fills it with light. So famous scripture, um, I'd be amiss if I didn't quote it while preaching John, John 3, 16. It says, God, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. For God didn't send his world, pay attention to this, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world but to save it through him. Jesus is gonna come again to judge The second coming, he's coming to judge. The first time he came not to judge, but to save it. And it says, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe has already been condemned because he doesn't believe in the name. There's only one name that can save us. John 12, 47, Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world, but to save the world. In John 10, 10, Jesus says, I've come that they might have life and have it abundantly. This is what he came to do. He came to give us an opportunity to enter into a relationship with the light that would transform our whole lives. 
So the question becomes, how do we get it? How do we get that life? How do we come out of the dark and into the light? So our third point is, we've seen John talk about the light revealed, the light getting rejected. Now we're gonna talk about how the light is received. Verse 12, he says this, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but God. First glance, we we might read this and and think that John's describing uh, the receiving of the light to be something that we do. So to all who did receive him. So a choice we make, uh, an action we do, something like that. I believed this probably for the first 10 years of my, my Christian life. Uh, I think I didn't even come to believe something different yet until well into my 20s. Uh, we sing songs about this. I remember singing songs about this in youth group. I found Jesus. Actually, it wasn't until after Bible school I realized it wasn't me who found Jesus, but Jesus who found me. You can't turn on a light switch and expect a blind man to find his way to the light bulb. Blind men actually need somebody to open their eyes. And this is precisely how we come to the light. Jesus isn't lost in the dark, waiting for us to come with our lame little flashlights. We are the ones lost in the dark and he's the one who comes after us. All who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So how are we born? How do we come to this light? How are we saved? Well, I wanna tell you, but first I wanna tell you three ways that we are not. Three ways we are not saved, and they're from the text. It says that we're not born of blood. First, you are not saved because of your racial or ethnic background. The Jews believed that they were saved simply because Jewish blood flowed through their veins. John says this is not the case. You're not born again because of who you were born from. You're not born again because of who you are born from. To transpose this to 2020, you're not saved because your mama was a Christian. You are not saved because you went to Sunday school or Awana. I'm so sorry that happened to you. I, you are not saved because you went to Christian school or Bible college. You are not saved because you checked Christian on the last census. You're not saved because of your racial or ethnic background. Secondly, you are not saved because of your passion or desire. Uh, the wording of this in the text says we are not saved um, by the will of the flesh. And and this wording, it can be a little confusing, but what it's communicating is the idea of two people in passionate love. Uh, It's communicating the idea of desire. And if our salvation is dependent on our desire, then we are up crack creek without a paddle because Jesus said we don't desire him. But desire by nature is not for him. It's not for the light. We're not saved because of our racial or ethnic background. We're not saved because of our passion or desire. And as he goes on to say, we're not saved because of our effort. Not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man. And this is a common belief, very common held belief. Most people think they need to do something in order to obtain forgiveness and salvation, but nothing could be further from the truth. Um, I don't have a slide for this because I wasn't planning on going here, but I'm gonna just hang uh, right in your Bible to Ephesians 2. Read the first nine verses with me. I love this text. It says, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Dead men don't choose Jesus. We're dead in our trespasses. Following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh. We were carrying out the desires of our body and mind. We were by nature children of wrath, but God, probably the sweetest two words in all of scripture, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. When we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive. By grace, 
you've been saved. How have we been saved? By grace. Verse eight, by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works so that no man may boast. We are not saved because of our racial or ethnic background. We're not saved because of our passion or desire and we are not saved because of our effort. We're saved because of the Father's desire. We're saved because of Jesus' work, Jesus' effort, Jesus' good works. That's the good news of the gospel. That's why James 1.8, the brother of Jesus said, of his own will he brought us forth. That's why 1 Peter 1.3 we read, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he's given us new birth. It's by his mercy. New birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. I used to sing this song growing up, I saw the light on Gaither Gospel Hour on TV. Again, if you saw that, I'm so sorry. Um, and I think it was me who found the light and walked out of the darkness towards it. Now I see it was the light who entered into my darkness and made me see. I saw the light changes from being this swagger anthem to being something that we just humbly sing on our knees when we rightly understand the gospel. Being something not that we got, but something that happened to us. We can only we can only be saved if we rightly see there is something that we need to be saved from. There is a darkness that we are presently in that we need to be rescued from by someone else other than ourselves. We need to see that there is a punishment that we deserve because of our rejection of God, that we rightly deserve. We need to see the bad news of our reality, our hopelessness, and the, the judgment that we deserve if we are ever to enter into the light that Christ offers us this life, this Zoe life that we've been talking about. We're saved by Jesus' work, by the Father's will. We're saved by Jesus' lineage. What we're gonna see is that we're actually saved in a way to Jesus' lineage, to children of God. And, and if you want that today, if you're listening and you're like, oh, I know I'm in a dark place. I know if it's up to me, I'm never gonna ever get it. If you want that and you're recognizing the darkness of your reality, I believe the Spirit's already begun to work in you, softening your heart, enabling you to see your need of rescue because he's actually come for you. He's inviting you to follow Jesus as the light and to live your whole life in pursuit of him. If you've ever seen uh, one of those videos on YouTube where someone's uh, cochlear, I don't know if I'm saying that word right, um, the in-ear implant is turned on and they hear for the first time. You ever seen that? And parents hear their child's voice for the first time. An adult hears the world for the first time. It's powerful. It's, it's really moving. It's hard not to tear up. This, this week I watched a video of these two uh, Indian twin girls who had never seen a day in their life and they did a simple surgery that enabled them to see for the first time. These two girls that had just lived in a dust bowl their whole life get given a surgery they would have never been able to afford and they get given the gift of sight and their response was awe. And they took the bandages off and they opened their eyes and saw for the first time they're crying. They're hugging each other. They're on their knees. And when we see the true light, when we behold Jesus as God, the true light of the world, the Savior who came and rescue, rescued us, gave us what we could have never got, our response should be exactly the same as these two little girls. Humble awe. If we've come to see the light, it's only because of Jesus. It's not our own doing. It's not because of our effort. It's not because we desired it. It's because of his grace. 
as I hopefully start to conclude here, uh, I want to point us back just to verse 12. To all who did receive him, he, who believed in his name, that divine logos, Matt, unpacked the first week, he gave the right to become children of God. It's like the, the video of the two Indian orphan girls receiving eyesight and then the doctor saying, hey, you don't have to go back to live in the dirt. You've just been adopted by a king. It's scandalous. It's unbelievable. And man, I would love to just spend another hour unpacking this phrase, child of God, because there's so much to mine here. There is so much scandal. There is so much just crazy, mind-blowing goodness here when we consider that. But I don't want to do that. I want to leave that for you. I want you to think on that. I want you to meditate on that. Do a word study this week. Look up that word, child of God. Trace it through the New Testament. In your silence and solitude, spend some time. Just meditate on that. Not only have we been rescued from the darkness, we've been made children of God. Think on that. It will blow your mind. That's crazy sauce. That's wild. That's crazy. That's way too good to ever be true. We've been taken from the dirt and not just healed. We've been invited into God's family. We've been made of the same lineage. We've been brought in and told that we're going to inherit the same things. It's given us a new type of life. We're going we're gonna to close now. Our band's going to come forward and we're going to respond in a few different ways. And first off, as we begin to respond, I just want you to meditate on this. That if you've called out to Christ for saving from your darkness, you've now become a child of God. Reflect on that. As you come forward, if you're present here and you take the bread and the wine and you dip the bread and the wine and remember just as the bread absorbs the, the wine, Jesus has absorbed all of the wrath of God that was reserved for you. As you do this, remember what it cost him and remember the reward that he purchased for us to enjoy in. New status, new life. You can do that at home too. And just take a moment and meditate on just that. You've been made a child of God. God's gifted you sight. He's made you a child. Just marvel at that. And then respond by worshiping together with us uh, the mighty name of Jesus. Let me close us in prayer. And Father, we... Thank you for your word. Thank you for coming in pursuit of us. Thank you that you are a God who is gracious and loving. Oh, are you loving? That towards those who had despised you, you came and by your grace alone transformed our hearts so that we would, we would see our need of saving. You grabbed us, you drew us like somebody draws water from a well. You drew us to yourself. You've regenerated our hearts. You've given us a new life and you've given us a new status, your children. All glory, all praise, all honors due back from you. For those times that we've tried to collect that for ourselves, where we've looked down our nose at people, forgive us. We are no greater than anyone. We are beggars in need of grace. Just think back to your rescue of me and I no way sought you, but you sought me and that's marvelous. And so Jesus, we, we praise you and we pray in your mighty name, amen.